Hello, I'm Art Dudley. The first thing I'd like to tell you about audio reviewing, always wear hearing protection when you're running your lawnmower. Otherwise, you can't do this job. As for other qualifications for the job, there are none. That's it. Welcome to my house. Rule number two, always wear sunscreen. If you don't have sunscreen on, you have to go inside. I don't have sunscreen on, so let's go inside. Come on, you can come with me. Well, that's better, isn't it? We're inside. We've come in from mowing the lawn. My advice, if you've got a lawn this big, get someone else to mow it. If I didn't review audio equipment for a living, maybe I'd be your lawnmower, but nah, just not into it. So this is my listening room. I've lived in this house for 14 years. It's been my listening room for 14 years. It's 12 feet wide, 19 feet long, with an 8-foot ceiling. These are my 1966 Altec Flamenco loudspeakers. I used to own Altec Valencias. It's essentially the same speaker, the same drivers, a, a horn-loaded compression driver for the mids and the treble, and a very large, 15 inches perhaps, 16 inches, something like that. I don't pay attention to this stuff. Woofer, great tightly suspended woofer, and you get really great sound out of these. I love these. They're the subject of some controversy, both for their sound, they're extremely sensitive, and for their appearance. My daughter loves these. My wife loves these. I like them for their sound. And I have them hooked up with the same uh, set of Auditorium 23 loudspeaker cable that I've had for, gosh, 10 or 11 years. Let's move on, shall we? Over here is my 1957 Garrard 301 turntable. This was given to me by a great reader named G.R. Kuntz. George, thank you. You have my enduring thanks for this. It's a transitional turntable. It's cream colored uh, chassis but a grease bearing. That's for all you vintage nerds like me. Remember how many Vintage nerds, does it take to change a light bulb? Five. One to change the bulb, four to say, gosh, the old one was so much better. This is in a stacked plywood plinth that I made myself, and I veneered with Coca Bolo. Advice number five, I think we're up to. Don't work with Coca Bolo. When you sand it, the dust is really toxic. It's really nasty stuff, and it gets all over everything. This is an Auditorium 23 tone arm mount. It's cast out of bronze and it's articulated, uh, articulatable I guess one would say. We'll get to that later. Uh, EMT 997 tone arm and right now I've got my EMT OFD 15 pickup head in there. That's a mono pickup head. Great sounding thing. Moving right along, do the Vanna White hand thing. This is my Shindo Macedo preamplifier. I've owned this for, I think, 10 years. Yeah, I think I bought it in 2007. It's a full function preamplifier. It has line stage and phono built in. And Ken Shindo, when he was alive, well, he, obviously when he was alive, he uh, put a modification in it so that I had two phono settings, one for regular stereo phono and a setting uh, that it's in now for mono that just takes the right channel and uh, superimposes it on the otherwise dead left channel. I think I wrote about that back in November of 2010 or 2011 or something like that. Sad that I remember it. My uh, amplifier is a Shindo Hobrion. This is a stereo Hobrion. In the old days they made these as mono blocks with I think KT88s. It's always been a low power push-pull amplifier and uh, it still is. This is just on a stereo chassis. It's about 20 watts a side and it uses vintage 6L6 GAY tubes. The GAY differs from other 6L6s. We're getting nerdy again, more vintage nerd stuff, because this has a uh, myconal uh, base, that reddish base. Uh, myconal 
uh, ceased to exist as a material and then years later somebody revived the trade name for an itch cream. So if you go to the drugstore and buy myconal, don't put it on your tubes. It won't work. Over here is another turntable. That's my Thorin's TD-124. This one, I own three or four of them. I lose track. I, my daughter has one. Um, this one was given to me by our copy editor, Richard Lehnert, who used to be Stereophile's music editor. And uh, thanks, Richard. Thanks, George. Where would I be without the generosity of, not strangers, but of uh, fellow audiophiles? And uh, that also has a stacked plywood plinth that I haven't yet veneered, and I probably won't. I think I'm just going to sand it and paint it, but it takes me so long to get around to things that it may never happen. Okay, let's move on. By the way, a plug for this book, The New Analog, Stephen Mejias, who has returned to Stereophile as a contributing editor, reviews this in our August issue, which will go in the mail in early July. And now there's a few things in my system that aren't in my system, but that I turn to from time to time. Uh, this is the Centec EQ11 phono preamplifier. And if I review, say, an integrated amplifier or a preamplifier that doesn't have a phono stage, this comes in real handy. It's got a lot of good uh, curves in addition to the standard RIAA. It's got a bunch of 78 curves and also controversy. Why should there be controversy in audio? I don't know. This is the new Shindo Monbrison preamplifier, also full function, line plus phono. This actually is the new version of the Macetto, which I own. The Monbrison doesn't replace the old Monbrison, it replaces the Macetto. It's confusing, but that's how they decided to do it. I write about this in the September issue, and uh, it's, it's quite the preamplifier. It's the only reason we're not listening to this right now, it's not in the system, because this doesn't have that mono mod yet. So uh, we wanted to listen to some mono records. And this is the Audio Desk System Glass Record Cleaner, hiding under his little veil. This is the Pro version. Had to break down and buy it. This is it. This is the record cleaner. This gets records, is clean. Not only does it get records cleaner than anything else I've ever used, it reveals as dirt things that I used to think were damaged. What more could you ask for from a record cleaner? Um, and it's sleeping right now, so we'll let him go back to sleep. I'd like to talk about this room for just a minute more. As I mentioned, this is my listening room. It's not my family's living room. Uh, and I'm a little bit sensitive about that. I'm not one of those people who likes the whole man cave thing. I'd rather be in the living room, but since this is what I do for a living and sometimes I have to listen at inopportune times, and I also do all my writing here at my desk, it's become sort of a necessity. But I'm one of those people who thinks audio should accommodate the consumer's lifestyle and not the other way around. I really don't like the idea of making sacrifices for audio. Obviously one makes a little bit of a monetary sacrifice, but I'm not into the whole sound treatment on the walls, cable risers under the cables, that sort of thing. It probably makes a difference and I'm not knocking it if you're into that. That's great. I'm just not. Uh, I, I try not to be too picky about this. I have sort of a casual approach. Um, I like when I review a piece of equipment, I want to give it a fair chance, but I don't want to throw every band-aid on earth at it until it sounds right. I, just not my approach. When people loan me a piece of gear, they know what system it's going to go into, and we go from there. This isn't just about hi-fi equipment. We test eye makeup too. <laughs> no, just kidding. The bunnies are pets. This is Noelle. Hi, Noelle. She's quite old. She's something like 10 or 12 years old. I'll have to ask my daughter. Let's talk about reviewing. Reviewing is easy. 
I don't know anything that you don't know. I'm just a person who knows how to write a little bit and is fortunate to have the opportunity to borrow audio gear from people and to write about it. That's it. You're just as good at this as I am. So if there's something that you like and people are telling you not to like it, trust your judgment. And at the same time, if there's something you don't like and everybody says you're supposed to like it, don't buy it. Save your money. Buy records and bunnies instead. I'm an audiophile. You can tell because I'm wearing white socks with a blue shirt. This is another bunny. This is Theo, and he's eating parsley. And this is a British room heater. Well, earlier we talked about how I have my EMT tonar mounted on an articulated tonar mount. It fastens underneath the plinth with a simple wing nut and you loosen it to move this around one way or the other. I'm not going to do it now because I've got it set up right where I want it for this toner. Here's the thing. Back in the March 2010 issue, we ran a feature article by Keith Howard, a brilliant writer, formerly the editor of Hi-Fi Answers in the UK. The article was called Arc Angles and it dealt with uh, phonocartridge alignment. And Keith uh, posited the, the, the idea, and I agree with it, that there are a couple of flaws in the Van Beerwald um, uh, formulas, in the, in the Van Beerwald numbers, because he didn't take into account uh, the actual grooved area of the LP. It turns out grooves on modern LPs do go in toward the center a little bit more than the ones when, when he was developing his information. So, Keith um, created a software package called Arm Geometer. I used that software to find out where the null points for proper phono cartridge alignment, you're going to have two null points. That is two points along the grooved area of the LP where there is zero tracking error. Those null points, uh, given some approaches to alignment, some people place the null points, one of them closer to the grooved area, to eliminate that pinch distortion of the very small radius groove, blah, blah, blah. Now, no need to get into that too tightly now. The thing is, I used the arm geometer software to compute the two null points for the EMT tone arm. One set of null points goes along with when you're using an A-style pickup head, and one set of null points goes along with when you're using a G-style pickup head. And I adjust those in this manner, I have a simple metal ruler where I machined a little notch, quarter inch, well, it's the radius would be an eighth of an inch, to go around the spindle of an LP player. I use the spacer. I simply put that under the little grommet to hold it still. It's raised up so that you know, if obviously geometrically, if you lowered it or raised it up, you'd be changing the dimension. I've marked the exact center of the top plate of the pivot cover of my tone arm. I loosen the arm board and I just adjust it until I get the exact spindle to pivot distance that will give me the null points that I want. I tighten it back up and boom, I'm in business. How do I know that every A-style and G-style pickup head is going to have the right spindle, uh, the right, pardon me, stylus to flange distance? I made a little jig. Yes, this is sad. This is the sort of thing I do in my spare time. I make stuff like this, which is simply a little ruler and a little piece of wood that accepts exactly the flange of a pickup head and it's set at the exact height so you'll see exactly where the stylus lands. Cool, huh? Oh, Mr. Hopper, I've got a strawberry for you. And you can have that strawberry if you help me review. It's supposed to be in A. I played it in G. Well, let's talk about one more aspect of reviewing.
And that's the whole idea of fidelity. The old timers were uh, really worked up about fidelity, and rightly so, but their idea of high fidelity tended to be limited to frequency response. Perhaps because that was uh, an elusive quality in the old days, and then along came speakers like the AR2A3 or the EPI100, usually acoustic uh, suspension speakers that really did, uh, for the first time, reasonably flat frequency response and hence lower coloration. And people loved that. And then when they would hear something like an LTEC Valencia or Flamenco or some other loudspeaker that didn't have quite as flat frequency response, they said, that's not high fidelity. You can't, you can't really hear what your recording is doing with that speaker. Well, you can. You could just hear different aspects of it because that AR2A3 compressed the dynamics really severely as opposed to an Altec Flamenco or some other loudspeaker that didn't. That Altec might be colored, so it might not have the best frequency response, but it had a more truthful, it reported dynamics more truthfully. And with dynamics, the sense of impact, the sense of touch, a sense of drive. So both are high fidelity products. They just happen to sound very different. There are so many facets too, so many aspects of music playback that it's really up to the consumer to decide what he or she wants. What are the things that are most important to you? And then go ahead and lean towards something you want. And it's the job of the reviewer to say how it, how it performs in all those different aspects. But don't let people bully you with accusations of what you like is distortion. Everything distorts. It's just different combinations of different sorts of distortions. Choose what you want. Remember how we do this? Good sound, disappointing sound, right channel, too dominant, mono, stereo. Not in the mood for a strawberry, are we? Okay. He could kill you with that tail. I'd just wait for him. <laughs> so cute. Did he look grateful or pissed? What's that? Did he look grateful or pissed? Pissed. 